Hi, COM331. I hope you are doing well. I saw an update from Eastern Campus that there was a gas leak, so I hope everyone is safe and tucked away. Um, I hope everyone's weekend was also really at least enjoyable. It rained here for the first time in months, and so I enjoyed all 25 minutes of that rainstorm. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get it started. A couple of announcements. One, well, make sure that you will be going to the classroom on Thursday. Dr. John will be leading you an activity and a couple of exam review materials. Make sure you go. You also have a homework reflection number three, too. Um, that's due Tuesday at 11 30 your time. Um, so I'm not sure when you'll be watching this, but ideally you'll submit it before you watch this lecture. And finally, if you have not already, make sure you tweet me at ZanerCSUSM and also use the hashtag EECOM331. That is a way for me to follow you and find you. Um, if you simply just liked me or reached out to my page, that's great. But I also need to either you use the hashtag or send me a separate message so I can make sure that you're added to our list. There are a number of you that have yet to do that. So let's get started in chapter two. Chapter two, here are a couple of some things with chapter two. First off, let me establish that I'm using the page numbers from the second edition and the vocab list is also from the second edition, but all of these are also included in the first edition. They just look a little bit different in terms of the page number. So here's some vocab. We have human communication interaction, packet switching, early adopters, user profiles, tagging, blogs, IP, virtual communities, EFF, and ports. The themes of chapter two are ranging. They start with both the self-perception and an online perception, and then it ends with a transparency, and even a little bit of community will dabble into communities as well. Let's start with this quote. DMC addressed identity formation, presentation, distribution, and other issues. Each one of us has an online presence expressed by what we choose to share about our others and ourselves. This happens through continuous and ongoing interaction with others. Self-presentation may be accurate in depiction or reflect virtual transportation to another place or ideal. Okay, what does this mean? I think we'll start off this idea that what we choose to share has some type of impact. If you go back to Jahari's window, this theory that there is this window into people, that there's four squadrons, and what we know about ourselves and we know about others, this is open communication and it's obvious that there's something in our lives that we don't know and they don't know and that's blind. So I had an interesting interaction with this in grad school. I left Pennsylvania and I came out to California and my entire life was spent either researching or reading books or complaining about being tired or thinking really important thoughts and then being active with that and then being thirsty for hot coffee because I needed more energy and I really became passionate about all these areas and I had a friend over one of the breaks say wow you seem really mm, stressed out there in California you seem really angry all the time and I hadn't realized that this level of me complaining about working long hours and in grad school and also being passionate came from a place that others would seem would be angry you know when i post my views or whatever it might be or i'm learning something important people can assume that to be like i am angry so i've actively begun to change that so now i'm really cognizant of what i'm posting most of my posts now are something about nature or greenery or beach scenes, this is not a humble brag, I'm just letting you know. Or it's something with a quote or a praise or a prayer or my running activities or somewhere on the water or me in education or reading or in some type of media. And so I'm really actively matching what I appear to be online and what you would probably meet me in person. That's an interesting idea because what other people assume to be of you you know, you can't necessarily change, but it's also important for you to realize that. So I want to ask you this. If a stranger saw your page, what kinds of things would they think? And is that accurate from what you try to depict yourself to be? What do I mean by this? Okay, so say I'm on any of your Facebook pages. 
what are some of the things that I would see and are these matching what you're intending to say about yourself? So if a stranger saw your online presence, what conclusions would they draw about you? What are the genres of pictures you have posted? What are the comments you have made? What are the type of words you've used in the captions? What are the pages you have liked on Facebook? And how frequent are your posts? Now, if you're not a Facebook user, that's absolutely fine. But pick whatever social media platform you use the most. If it's on Instagram or Snapchat, or whatever it might be, pick that one that you use the most. If someone was to stumble onto your content, what would they see? What kind of phrases would they see? What kind of experiences would they think? Would this be happy or a calm place? Anyway, so this is your first question. So I would encourage you all to go to your own Facebook page and view it as it would be a complete stranger. Now, if you have certain privacy settings, I, I don't mean someone that is a complete stranger to you. Obviously, someone that has access to all parts of your account that has um, at least friended you and at least can see the main points of your pages. What would they see? How does that match with you? So you can go ahead and pause here. I'll also post these these questions separately on our discussion board. You're more than welcome to check them out there. But I'll continue on this lecture. Another quote, early communication studies demonstrated an understanding about your behavior, sharing, socialization, entertainment, and following. By performing future systematic content analysis of language using online interaction, it may be possible to discover emerging patterns of interaction and engagement. This research should strengthen understanding about the nature of popularity, social isolation, opinion diffusion, and social network leadership. Now, if you are in some type of research methods class, this is going to be related to you, um, especially if you've already done your homework reflection, this would also be something that you've already thought about. But this is something that I consistently think about. I mean, I think about how I come to class and I watch my students three times a week come in, sit down, and we sit next to the same people for weeks and weeks and weeks. And at the end of the semester, I have my Cal State students do this assignment where they have to do a peer workshop. And I consistently overhear many people say, I'm so sorry, what is your name again? Or I forget your name, what is it? And it baffles me after 14 weeks of sitting next to one another, they still don't know their names. Talk about isolation, that you're sitting next to people and yet you can't, or you don't, talk to them. So one area of scholarly work that I would be interested in would be thinking about our word choices. I'd be interested to quantify the number and variability of word choices people have when describing an image. Okay, so this is a bit of a tangent, but here's where I would like research to go. Recently, a couple years ago, no, last year, my girlfriends and um, a cousin and I went to Texas. We went to go see the Magnolia Farm. If you don't watch Fixer Upper with Chip and Joanna Gaines, this may not make a lot of sense to you, but we went to this show, we went to this um, Magnolia Field, and here is the description I would use. I would say that the town of Waco is absolutely desolate. <laughs> there is nothing around. In fact, we parked on the street and we like trekked through this gravel train yard to get to the Magnolia campus. And so here's a picture that my friend took of us kind of like trekking through one of the fields, although we've already passed a couple of them, and getting to the silos. But it's interesting describing this experience of walking through Waco and really understanding the impact of how important it is to be renovating these houses because all the show shows you is this beautiful version of how pretty the silos are. Okay, I know, shameless plug about Magnolia, but how interesting would it be if in the future we can study our linguistic choices between explaining the images on the left and then explaining the images on the right with words rather than this ability to quickly grab our phone and just show someone. That's really easy, but what kind of word choices can I use to describe desolate and beautiful? So moving on. When people say that there is a need for more engagement with social media, they may not understand that stronger relationships are built upon transparency. So Again, in your reflection, you should have 
identify with various platforms what kind of adopter you are. Um, if we want more transparency, here are some five major stages of this. Number one, awareness, two, interest, three, evaluation, four, a trial, and five, adoption. So you should have picked one of the five types of adoption. You know, if you are, say, a laggard or an early adopter, this isn't necessarily a new idea. Um, the adoption process isn't necessarily only related to social media. I know that in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, from a number of years ago, he also explains something similar in these theories related to business technology. But I want to get to this conversation. Lipschitz wants us to create a stronger relationship on transparency, yet there are a few instances when this ability to be transparent is at risk. I'm referring to the Declaration of Independence in Cyberspace. Um, first of all, this document is beautifully written. Nope, not the slide I want. Hold on. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, so, the Declaration of Internet Cyberspace, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. It's beautifully written. I, I think that the word choices and the phrasing, it's certainly shocking how relevant it still is. I don't remember how voting works in Pennsylvania. Um, but we are headed into like this Mr. Mr. Elections here in California. And when we have elections, we have a bunch of other additional propositions added to the ballots besides just voting for people. And sometimes the propositions are 10, 15, 20 ballots deep. Or, I'm sorry, propositions deep. So we have booklets that get nailed out that are really thick explaining all the propositions. For example, last election we voted on this prop to ban plastic bags at the grocery stores. You either bring your own bags or you pay 10 cents per bag or you simply carry all of your items like you're a pack mule, which is what I do because I consistently forget my bags and I refuse to pay 10 cents a bag. So we voted on this prop last election. It's since been implemented and so that's one example of a prop. So what's coming up and what's currently being voted on in our state is that um, net, net neutrality is being voted on. So what does net neutrality mean? There we go. Okay. What is net neutrality? It's the battle between corporate businesses wanting the option to charge to regulate inner traffic, like if you want to watch a show on Hulu and you have Comcast. You may have to pay an additional bundle amount for Hulu to load faster or really even at all. Currently, we have an open access internet. I know that there are plenty of ideas out there about the accessibility of our internet. Like, we are privileged, if you have internet at home, we are privileged to own a device that can connect to the internet. We are privileged to afford shelter long enough for the internet to be connected, etc. My brother works for a nonprofit in Philly that helps use open sourcing and helps to connect and daisy chain internet to people that don't normally have it accessible. So he would say that our privilege to have internet is certainly consistently um, forgotten about. Okay, so we're not just talking about the accessibility of internet, of having a home and having internet, but net neutrality would make a considerable difference between the financial abilities of different people. So if I want to pay extra, I can if I want to have access to certain websites or certain content or certain news stories. And this is certainly problematic when you think of how this is relating to communication. How does this relate to COM or even Eastern students or really anybody in the USA? Well, you may already know about filter bubbles and that filter bubbles prioritize and minimize certain content. If you don't know anything about filter bubbles, I can go ahead and put a link up on our page about a TED Talk that explains filter bubbles. Think of filter bubbles, but intensified. That is the current state of what we are voting on for net neutrality. And the Internet Declaration of Independence Cyberspace um, addresses that. And so I want you to look at this document. Depending on which edition it is, maybe on different pages. but it starts off with governments of the industrial world. You may be weary giants of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, et cetera, et cetera. So I want you to read this document if you haven't already from chapter two. And then I want you to answer this question. Write two points. 
one opinion of the document and one question for the author or others about the document. So I want you to write two things about this document. One, what's your opinion? And two, what's a question you either have for the author or other people that they may be able to answer the, the question for you. Again, if you're in first edition, this is page 35. If you're in the second edition, it's page 48. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and pause here. If you want to switch to the discussion board now, again, the prompt will be up there, but also we can continue the lecture here. Okay, social media communication represents an evolution of individual social and cultural desires to connect with new people. In the context of social media communication, there's an ongoing fear that virtual spaces confuse reality, representing myth and ritual as truth. CMC is a tool that may lead people with problems to take these to online environments rather than, as it is often assumed, the negative effects being caused by online usage. Again, what do all of these quotes mean? Oh, man, they're all so good. Okay, so let's first start with, we have this instinctive, natural need to connect with people. You wanna make someone absolutely go crazy and be disconnected and really have harmful reactions, you put them in a room by themselves. You put them in isolation. We are wired to be with one another. So rather than social media being this place where people spend more time and waste it and it's not helpful, we're using it as a community place. We're, really, we're using it as a place to meet other people rather than um, it causing more problems the CMC tool is led to believe that we are benefiting from online communities more. But what happens when these virtual spaces confuse reality or what we think is reality, because we can certainly say and debate about what reality actually is. And I like how chapter two ends with this idea that our communities also come out in different choices. And that's where Lipschitz goes out about memes. There are three points of memes that they're both understood as cultural information that pass along from person to person. They reproduce a various means of imitation. And then they're interesting because they're diffusion through competition and selection. I think of this like cultural dances or certain songs. There are some songs that they make it through generations and generations and generations of people. My mom, for instance, she was a wild disco woman in the 70s, and she talks about how she would go roller skating into the disco clubs, um, and how she would then sing those disco songs around the house when I was raised. Now, I don't want to listen to disco, so there's something happening with her community of disco people and not transferring to my community. However, there are other songs that consistently stand the test of general time. I'm thinking of the electric slide. I'm thinking of, again, chicken dance. I'm thinking of, um, oh my gosh, the Macarena, or, I mean, you name it. These are older dances that have made it through generations of people that will most likely be at future weddings. So the same idea for memes. We take them, we update them, we apply them, we take them, we update them, we apply them, we take them, we update them, we apply them. And this is how our communities and memes are understood. I really liked this part of the chapter. Here's a funny image to be our transition from this slide to chapter six. If you have not had a meme experience, you can go ahead and check them out. There's also games about them and there's there's quotes about them and there's a whole world of memes that I don't understand, but I certainly enjoy learning more about other people in space and how they understand what's happening. All right, so let's take a trip to chapter six. Okay, so the themes of chapter six are the metrics and platforms. This is completely unrelated to chapter two but important nonetheless. nonetheless. We will focus on this chapter in more of the how-tos. We'll focus more on some actual practical skills at the end of this, rather than a theory of how communication and self-perception is understood like we did in chapter two. So here's some vocab terms. We have reliability, validity, which is the same in research methods, verified accounts, Twitter analytics, which you now have experience in, measurement error, word cloud, social media dashboard, network visualization. 
Is there a relationship between Facebook content to which you are exposed and your emotional status? I really liked this question. I want to spend some time here because I know it's often a hot topic. If you were one of the awesome folks that attended the guest speaker interview with Peter Schinger, you would know the magical number that is considered to be the number of successful engagements. So I want to pose this next question. It's meant to be interactive. So um, here are all the numbers that a, a typical successful engagement post might be. Does it gain 10%, 15, 20, 25, 50, 65, 75, 80, or 100%? What would you consider a successful post? Give you a second to think about it. Okay. So let's limit down some options. We know that it's not going to be 100%. That's not successful engagement. And thank goodness, because if 100% of my friends didn't like every one of my pictures, that must be completely debilitating living in this world where everybody has to like everything that we post and we engage with. So it's not 100%. We also know it's not going to be 15%. That's a little bit low going down, we're going down. Our last four options are 10, 20, 65, and 80 percent. Which do you think is a successful engagement post? The answer is 10 percent. Are you surprised to hear this? 10 percent is considered a successful engagement number. If you have a thousand friends on Twitter and a hundred hundred of them either like or retweet or comment or interact with your post, that's considered successful. So if you have 30 friends and you get three friends to like something, that's a successful post. I know that many people are, are arguably shocked to hear that, but that's actually really a big relief because only 10% of the people in your life and the people that you're connected with um, are considered successful. <laughs> Okay, so the biggest theoretical problem with the internet sampling and the relationship between what one assumes to be population and the actual population is unknown. You might be sampling what you think is one group in a certain age range, a certain part of the country, a certain part of hobbies and interests, and you are completely wrong. And there's not necessarily a way to know that you are correct or incorrect, which is certainly problematic from a research standpoint. Traditional, commun tr traditional communication research methods emphasize rigorous and transparent methodologies, ground studies and social theory, conceptualized measurement and oper operationalized definitions. Academic researchers also have concerns about the validity of measures because we cannot assume to know what social phenomena is being measured. So if you are in research methods, this would make a lot of sense to you. How can we reliably study something and yet we don't know what we're studying. What kind of hypothesis are we going to be creating knowing that we're going for one type of social phenomena yet how do we even know that we're studying that phenomena? Here is what I am thinking when I see this. For one, I wonder about the forums. If someone passes away, there are now these forums that are created through various websites and hosting either news sources or um, online obituary sources that are like forever. And so instead of signing an obituary log, people can go on and leave messages for their loved ones. I'm not sure if you've seen these before, but um, it's something I've seen before and I've posted on them before as well. So the idea is it's like a any type of social media page, but this lasts forever and it's maintained by the family of the deceased. And I really, this is something that is interesting to me because do we necessarily go on and leave messages for the loved ones knowing that they cannot actually access this information? Or are we going on for the purpose of being community and solace? Or are we going on in a to be supportive of the family that passed away? It's interesting. I'd want to set the triggers of why people go online to to use these online um, obituary logs, and yet I wouldn't even know where to study that. I wouldn't even know what kind of a, a communication term to use for this. <laughs> I wouldn't know what kind of social phenomena, phenomena is actually happening because I know that happens in real life that you send a card to someone that lost someone recently. You 
send flowers or show up to the funeral or the viewings? And how can I also study those kinds of grief and coming of acceptance in online forums? So that's one example of how do I even go about studying the social phenomena? If I need to be having a consistent grounded theory and valid and consistent measurement, how do I go about this if it's online? Well, here are seven measurement principles that you should be having. I'm sorry, this, this is hiding. No, no, here we go. I'm sorry, I can't figure out how to get rid of this bar. But the first point is the importance of goal setting and measurement. Number two, measuring the effect of outcomes is preferred to measuring outputs. Number three, the effect on business can and should be measured where possible. Number four, media measurement requires quantity and quality. Number five, averages are not the value of public relations. Number six, social media can and should be measured. Number seven, transparency and replicability are a paramount to sound measurement. So I'm going to switch from some research material to some how-tos in a moment. For one, here are seven, seven measurement principles. And then once you've actually established the social phenomena, your hope you're studying, you then will goal set. You'll then measure the effect of outcomes rather than how many people liked your content. Both quantity and quality are also important. And after you do this once, in terms of studying a social phenomena on this, you then will do it again and again and again the following week. That makes your studies and your material statistically important and reliable. Okay, success. I have figured out how to do the top bar. Okay, so after you have those seven points, you then will go on to these other parts. Now, you'll be doing something similar for the company case study. You'll go into a company, look at the Facebook total likes, you'll look at the Twitter followers, so look at the website traffic, the email signups. Some of these you won't have access to, but you at least do something very similar um, to this when you look at someone's page. On the I don't know, page 115 in your edition or first edition in 17 second edition, it shows you the top social media influencers. The second edition updated it, so it actually has more than the three of the four that it had on the first edition. And here they are. We have the top people on the left hand side, their Twitter handle, their identity or what they do, and then the score. Have you heard of these people before? Are you interested or fascinated to hear that these are the top people? I mean, I haven't heard of some of them. So I think it's interesting that they have top followers and they are the top social media influencers that um, I don't know who Ian Hadley is or Chris Brogan or Marty Smith. So first I want you to do. For the third part of the discussion prompts, I want you to look at this list of the top social media influencers. Choose one that you can identify their target based on the kinds of words that they use in their tweets. So pick one person, go to their Twitter page, look at what kind of words they use, what kind of phrases are they using. Then identify what kind of audience they are really marketing themselves to or branding themselves to. And part B, if you haven't heard of one of them, make sure that you go on different types of their platform. If you've never heard of um, Ashton Kutcher, maybe you go on his Twitter and then you also go on a Facebook page, you also go on there, etc. So two things, you'll be both finding someone and identifying what you think is their audience, and number two, you'll be finding someone that you don't know and identifying their audience. Hang tight as I now want to show you some how to's. So you've had three discussion prompts, you're more than welcome to pause the video, go answer those, and then come back to this. But I want to show you HoopSuite and then also Twitter analytics. So the great thing about HoopSuite is that you can schedule tweets, you can stream multiple accounts, but it does have an extra payment requirement if you use it more than 30 scheduled tweets and three 
streamed accounts. You can combine Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Oh, now this should be a video. Ha, here we go. So here's what Hootsuite looks like on the left hand side. You'll see me and I'm going to go ahead and download my analytics. I've already done this before, so I'm going to hide into the preview. Because I don't use Twitter as my, I don't know, main form of payment in life, I'm not a Twitter expert, they will adapt more of your information based on how many followers you have, based on how much interaction you have. So this is what at least it looks like if I'm going to download from this page. This would look very different if I were a Twitter social media influencer. So this is Hootsuite. You can also schedule certain tweets. I have one scheduled for tomorrow morning. So we'll see how that goes. So that's Hootsuite. I'm going to show you that. I also want to show you the Twitter analytics. I know that you've experienced with that with your option that was due to stay at, at 11.30 your time. Um, Twitter analytics is very user friendly and you get out of it what you put into it. If you don't want to spend a lot of time understanding Twitter ads, that's fine. You don't have to. But if you choose to do it, you have a lot more options for Twitter analytics. Let's go ahead and watch another video where I will briefly run through looking at a Twitter analytics page. So I've had you do something really similar. We walk into your page, you see some top tweets, you see top interactions, and then uh, you can also see all of your tweet activity. I like this customizable calendar that you can change what kind of date you're looking at. If you only want to do a couple of campaigns, say you're in a nonprofit, and you want to look at a campaign if you're trying to raise money or you're trying to get a certain amount of books, you can see your impressions and your top tweets from that specific date range. You can also see the top tweets, the tweets replies. If you use Twitter ads, you can also see what's promoted. You can also change your audiences. Again, because I'm uh, on Twitter 24 seven, um, you, this isn't really um, as beautiful as it could be, but it certainly tells you what are the types of Twitter users that are out there and how can you market your page and bring yourself to the people that are also on Twitter. And so I think that this is really much more customizable if you were getting into Twitter. Lastly, because I'm not on it, you can also go ahead and go into additional material. How can I promote pages? How can I help other pages? How can you use an account? That's just not where I'm at right now. But that certainly is helpful because if you, are, again, are with a nonprofit or say you're with a soccer team and you're trying to raise money to go to a trip to go to a tournament of some sort, you can certainly help boost your page by asking people to donate. So there's a couple of how-tos related to both Hootsuite and Twitter analytics. Today we talked about chapter two, about this self-perception and our online perception. We also talked about the importance of transparency. Chapter six, we talked about social media and metrics. If you haven't read either chapter, you need to go back. You certainly need to read chapter two. Personally, I find it fascinating and I can sit and talk about the theories of social media all day long. And then chapter six, if you have never been on any social media, you should definitely read chapter six and at least go under some of the metrics. There are tons of other how-tos and assuming that you will be doing something like this for your job at some point, they also will train you. Um, remember Peter talked about a couple of other types of online metric data that is only available for people in that industry. You'll have something most likely very similar. Again, if you're going into something with social media, if you're going into like language, um, a language job where you are teaching Spanish or you are fluently working with different schools and different types of language speakers, you will have different analytics in your keywords and your word files will be very different in other languages as well. Anyway, let's wrap up. So on Thursday, make sure you go to the classroom, you'll do an activity and an exam review. It probably will be helpful if you bring your textbook. So go ahead and bring whichever edition you have for the Lipschitz and Kim, although most of our content for this first exam is Lipschitz, if not all of it. Let me double check. Good talking to you. I am on Twitter. I am on email. If you have any questions, I hope you'll have a great Monday or Tuesday, depending on whenever you watch this. Bye.